Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, the I would like to ask Mark to say a few words, as today's learning is in memory of Dr. Jody Tilbury. So. First of all, thank you uh, all for being here, and uh, Shavuot to It's so nice to see everybody, all the faces that I've heard about, and all the faces that I haven't. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do um, when we uh, sponsored this, uh, this learning is to make sure some of Dodi's students were, uh, were, part of, uh, were part of this program and to expose as many of you who haven't been exposed to them uh, to these great teachers who, uh, who trained with Dodi and who Dodi learned from as much as I think she taught. And, um, you know, one thing that I've thought about often in the last couple of months is, you know, what Dodi would think or what Dodi would say at certain times. And as we're uh, approaching Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Slonimer talks about Rosh Hashanah being a time of almost rebirth for each of us, that we start the year from fresh and we have the ability to set our course for the year as we desire. So I think one of the main things that I would think that Dodi would say as we set our course is what should we be focused on as we go into Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and for the whole year. And I think the most important thing that I think that I could take from my experience of living with Dodi was this idea, her idea that she expressed to me numerous times, and I think to others that she expressed, was this desire to have a personal relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and to work on our tefillah as much as we work on other things in our life. And um, I've thought often that not everybody can be a Tamid Chacham or a Tamid Chacham, but everybody could be a great daughter and everybody can work on their relationship with God. And I think that that message as we go into Rosh Hashanah is something I think we can all take and hold on to. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, the learning that we're doing today uh, will be a Lui Nishmat of Dodi. And uh, we will all have a Shana Toba and all the things that we ask a Baruch Hu during our daughter should come to fruition. And uh, again, thank you all for being here. Reminder to you. Uh, I'm sorry. Reminder to turn off your ringers and people online remind, remember to. You. It's on. I'll make it louder if that needs. That needs to speak though. <clears throat> Taking a tissue because I've been doing a lot of crying lately, and uh, I spoke to Mark, and uh, I think we both reflect on the fact that sometimes the year after is. Even uh, more difficult in the sense that you have a year to process, you have a year to think, you have a year to miss, and you have a year to recognize how much has really been lost. And therefore, it's a yeah, tremendous hope this morning to be able to be here and to be here with all of you, and to be here also not only a year after, but to have this hope of learning Torah together. I'm even going to add in one of Dodi's beloved Bate Midrash. We all know and re remember so well how when this sniff of Matan was in Renak Green's house. Everyone remember that and how Dodi would stand and introduce special days just like today. She would get up and introduce with all of her flair and excitement and uh, keep everyone very well entertained until I arrived. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and then uh, with her, her grace and uh, her beauty and her ever-present smile and humor would uh, then, in a very serious note, sit down in the front of the class and sometimes in the back row and uh, assiduously take notes as one of, uh, of the Tommy Dot, knowing that she could also and give the shi'ur at any time and then to have this foot not only of uh, working together with her here, but in Yerushalayim and in Baruch Hashem. And uh, training together, teaching together, instilling in uh, the teachers of tomorrow, Anna, such as Adina, we'll hear from another student, Miriam, right after. And therefore, I think it's very appropriate this morning to speak about a theme on one hand, a theme that we introduced last year in Sefer Shoftim. And if you remember, I asked you uh, to, to stay really with uh, your suspense 
so this year, and I think very appropriate to dedicate this sheet work of the stories and struggles and the songs of childless mothers in Tanakh, the Zakra, the Le'iloi Nishmata of Dr. Dodi Tobin. And I put here a beloved mother in keeping with the theme of today's Shi'or, but certainly beloved wife, beloved daughter, <coughs> beloved sister, and definitely friends and teacher. So we get started with a little bit of background. Whenever we learn a story, whenever we appreciate a sacred Tanakh, we have to put it within its context, its historical context, its textual context. And therefore, as we explore, not just Sefer Shoftim, but Sefer Shmuel, in anticipation of uh, the choicest of the Haftarot, for Rosh Hashanah. And I say that because it's clear that when Chazal selected Shmuel Aleph, the story of Chana, as Haftarah for Rosh Hashanah, on the first day, they're basically saying, this is what's supposed to set the tone for the day. This is what you're supposed to be thinking about. This is what you're supposed meant to be internalizing. So let's take a look and appreciate that the first chapter of Shmuel is authored by none other than Shmuel Hanavi, who also authored, as we know, his own Sefer Shmuel and Shoftim and Ruth. And uh, what's interesting is that we pointed out last year that there is a verb that appears particularly in these, uh, in these Barim that we don't find too often in Tanakh and at Baruch Hashem today. We don't uh, just have the availability of concordances. We can open up Al HaTorah and uh, to put in this verb of vatokom. We saw that in the scenes, if you remember, of Dvorah, but then again, in the scene of Chana and Shmuel, we see vatokom Chana. Chana gets up. And that's a very strange term because the next thing we find, she's standing before Eli. So obviously, in order to stand, what did she have to first do? She had to stand up. So why is it that the Navi feels that he has to go out of his way to tell us about this verb. Now it's true, we also find it in the male form, and every once in a while, but we find something very systematic with regard to when it's employed, particularly by women. So we turn back to stories in Tanakh, and we find, as you see, the 18 references that we have in Tanakh to this verb, avatakom, where in each time, it really does seem rather redundant. We don't need the verb per se, and yet, it appears nonetheless. For example, benot lot, batishkana gabalai lahu etabihen yayin, batokom hatsira batishka bimo. Why do we need to hear that? She got up and then she lay down with him. Obviously, redundant here. Similarly, batokom rivka vanarotaha batirkavna al hadmalin. If she's going to ride on a camel, then obviously she got up first. By tamar, batokom batelach, batasar tifa me aleha. Here, perhaps we do need the verb by virtue of the fact that she was sitting in mourning, waiting around for her father-in-law to call her to marry the third son, Sheila. But as we take a look now at source number four, we know it in the story of Dvorah. Dvorah has called upon Barak ben Abinoam, the general at the time, to come and wage war as HaKadosh Baruch Hu had commanded against the oppressive Kna'anim at the time. And she says, I don't understand. God came to you and told you that you're supposed to initiate a war. And Barak says, well, yes, but I don't want to go without you. And Zvorah at that point has a choice. She can either say, well, you are the military chief over here. This is really your responsibility. I'm the one sitting judging on the Israel. I have a religious role to play. And yet, we see Batomer, hello, chilech Dvora could have remained passive and just waited around until Barak would have, would not have mustered sufficient courage to initiate this war. And yet, what does she do? She says, okay, I'll go with you. I'll go out of my comfort zone. And she gets up. And what we already see then is that in each one of these cases, one really could have remained passive. In other words, Batakum was not necessarily a depiction of a physical act in as much as one of a psychological nature. One wherein the author, both in the case of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Torah, and certainly in the words of Nebiyim and the Ketuvim, is depicting an initiation a proaction on the part of the women 
particularly, and notice how each scene depicts a very passive male. We go back, for example, to the story of Lot, wherein they're all convinced that the rest of the world has been destroyed. And what is Lot doing? I can imagine he lost his wife. He only sees his two daughters. He's probably thinking, this is it. You know, what should I do now? And we're thinking, we'll go back to Abraham Avinu. There's a whole society that he's building on the right values of tzedek and mishpat. But no, instead, it's going to be the daughters who engage in chesed without the mishpat. In the case of Tamar, her father-in-law, Yehuda, is very passive. He really should have done something, should have called upon Tamar, should have said, Maybe if I am uncomfortable with Sheila fulfilling Yibum, then maybe we should perform Chalitza so that Tamar can marry someone else. And yet, no, he's passive, but Tamar. Tamar gets up. And the story then clearly up to around. We're going to see the ensuing sources as well. Each one depicts a, a passive male character who should have done something and instead remains passive on the sidelines while the woman gets up. Even in the case of Rivka, Eliezer, the Evid thought, okay, I'm just supposed to go. He didn't realize that it has to be Rivka's initiative as Abraham had already implored, she must undergo her own lech lecha. Batakom Rivka, don't worry. In the end, it is Rivka who's going to get up and proactively go to the land promised to her bequeath promised to Abraham Yitzchak. In the case of Abigail, another story. Here, her husband, Naval, Kishmo Kenhu, disgusting, selfish Naval, should have gotten up and not only offered, but finally paid David Hamelech his dues, paid David what he rightfully deserved. But while he remains passive and drunk, it's going to be Abigail who gets up and is going to greet David and thereby prevent bloodshed in her home. In the case of Shlomo, there's an Isha Achat, Isha Acheret, Vatokon Betol Chalayla, Batikachet Benim Etzli, each one accusing the other of being proactive in a negative way. Similarly, by Eshet Yerabam, in each one of these stories, Isha Hashunamit, Atalia, Notice even the Eshet Chayel of Sefer Mishle, authored by Shlomo Batakom Ba'od Layla, at the time that everyone else is passive, everyone else is sleeping, there's someone who gets up. And this uh, certainly, I remember Mark telling me that there were times that Dodi would just say, a little more, a little more, I have to prepare this year a little more. You go to sleep, vatakom. But it's the woman who's going to go and ensure vatiting teref levita vachok lenaroteha. And then we proceed to the ketubim, to the story of Ruth. In the case of Naomi, it's very clear. The exposition of Sefer Ruth begins with the activity of Elimelech, Machlon, Chilion. Naomi is taken perhaps even as a very passive character, from her beloved homeland to Eretz Moab. And after both her husband and then subsequently, Machlon Chilion, her children die, she really could have bereaved, she could have mourned, she could have stayed by their graveside in Moab. And that would have been the end of the story, and for that matter, a course basically changed in Jewish history. But no, Vatakom Naomi. Naomi is going to get up from a state of depression, from a state of passivity, and she is going to change the trajectory of Jewish history. She's the one to get up first. But then Ruth follows suit. Once they do enter Eret Yisrael, and Ruth sees the sorry state that they're in, while Nomi is busy looking through the yellow pages of Google Earth for the closest Goel, it's going to be Ruth that gets up and recognizes they have to put food on the table. And while Boa still remains passive, Ruth is going to go get up, and she, as we know, is going to demand that Boa secure her future. And similarly, the case of Esther, and then Atalia depicted again in Devei Hayamim, we see this recurring theme. And as you can imagine, we can truly develop this into a series of at least 18 shirim. But for now, in anticipation of Rosh Hashanah, we're going to take a look at the works of Shmuel Hanavi in particular, and even more particularly, 
see how it's not only these women, these three, four women, the stories of clearly Shoftim, the story of Devorah, the story of Naomi and Ruth, and finally the Haftarah that we're going to read in less than a week, the story of Hannah. And in each one of these stories, not only do we hear a passive male and a proactive female, not only do we hear of uh, the actions and initiatives that are taken that truly do change the course of Jewish history, we're also going to know that there is another interesting phenomenon, albeit not necessarily in the case of uh, Abigail, but in the case of uh, the women, uh, aforementioned women, we see another very interesting phenomenon, that being that they're all childless. And by that I mean that in the case of Deborah, we don't hear of any child in the story. We hear she's Eshet Lapidot, but isn't that interesting? A woman without a child. But the irony is all the greater, and that when she sings her famous song, she calls herself Ad Shekanti Dvora Kanti Aim Bi Yisrael. She calls herself a mother, but she's not a mother. She is a warrior right now. She is a judge, a prophetess, a wife, but not a mother. And yet Shmuel Hanabi calls her a mother. Similarly, in the case of Naomi, Batakom Naomi, Naomi was a mother, lost her children, and yet Shmuel makes sure to call her the mother. Albeit, Ruth is the one to have the child. Ruth is not called the mother, but Naomi, the childless woman, is called the mother. And lastly, Hannah. Hannah, ironically, as we know, albeit barren at the beginning, once she has a child and thereby will be called a mother, she's called a mother, particularly in the context of Shmuel, with whom, what does she do? She basically gives him, gives him away. And that's when she's called a mother, when uh, she basically forfeits, when she donates, as she uses the term, Shaul Lahashem, when she loans her son to God, that's when she's a mother. Notice then how Shmuel Hanabi, very particularly, will call three childless women. He will call them mothers. And the question is obviously, why? Shmuel, what are you trying to teach us? Let's go back to the story of, of Dvorah, where we see the unsuspected heroines, as we discussed, those who are going to rise up Vatokom from a state of passivity and truly become the people wrote of the story. We begin, if you remember, in a Shoftim, Perak Dali, by a Sifu Bnezer, La Sota Rabbe Nehashem, the Ehud Met, the Imkarim Hashem, the Yavin Malakanan, Asher Malach, the Hatsor, the Sarts of Osisra, Ruhu Yoshe, the Harosha Tabuim, by Yitzakub and Israel of Hashem, Kichamio, Drecha Barzello, reminiscent of the oppressive Egyptians, Ruhu Lachat, the Nesra of Hoska, Estrim Shana. And we're very familiar with this exposition because we've seen it already by Otsniel and Knaz, we've seen already, already by Ehud and by Shangar. And what was the common theme. What should be the next pasuk? This is really just closing your knowledge of Sefer Shoftim. What should be the next pasuk after we hear the exposition of an oppressive nation? And then, excellent, they cry out by Yitzhaku. And then what's the next stage? A Moshia. And generally, again, either Hashem instills, inspires someone with Ruach Hashem, like in the case of Atzmiya, or Ehud gets up on his own. We're waiting. Where is that Moshia? Where is that military general who's going to unify Am Yisrael? Who's going to take some action and finally wage war against the oppressive enemy? Who is going to be the one to search and basically uh, succeed in a triumph? for autonomy in Eretz Yisrael. So notice how the Navi says, okay, little twist in the tale here, plus a salad, a little ironic, and you're thinking that's very nice. Devorah, we like you, especially as women, but no offense, we don't need you right now. Who do we need right now? We need a general. We need someone who's going to go and fight against the Kna'anim. He yoshevet. 
She's doing her job as judge. She's judging the people. In the center of the country, she sits. This is what she should do. This is her role. She's judge. She's prophetess. They're going to go up to her. And that's why Dvorah calls upon Barak and says, your job, I really took two psukim away from you already. You were the one who should have answered, I even know the plan. God gave you the whole strategy. Why are you so passive? Go up to her tabor. We both know that this is the plan. God told you he will bring everyone to Nachal Kishon. It's so simple, Barak. Just go. God is going to help you. He gave you the strategy, gave you the location. Here are the coordinates. Go and fight this war. We're all thinking. He should be the hero of the story. The uh, Nabi is basically telling us that he is the suspected hero. Devorah says it in clear terms as she explicates, you are the one who should get up and go. And Barak instead is going to cower behind the curtain. I'm not sure. Depictive of the entire generation, very suspect of Hakadosh Baruch Hu's interaction, Hakadosh Baruch Hu's involvement. He says, "I'm not so sure. If you come with me, Dvorah, then I'll have the confidence." And Dvorah could have said no, but instead, Batomer Haloche Lechimach Efes Kilotia Tefar Tachal Hadera Hasharata Holech. You're not going to get the credit for this war. And notice the term she uses, ki biyad isha yim kor Hashem et Tisra. Hashem instead will give up the victory to the hand of a woman, vatokom. And she will get up and from here on in, Barak remains behind the curtain. Dvora is going to be in the spotlight and Barak transforms himself from what should have been a primary character role to a secondary one. We're already getting a sense then of the employment of this term, recognizing how the Navi wants to tell us you would have thought it should have been Barak. Notice then, Dvorah steps up to the plate. In a very similar vein, we now turn to the Haftorah that we're going to read, Be'ezrat Hashem Shabbat Rosh Hashanah, Who's going to be the hero of the story? Pretend you don't know the story. Who's the hero of the story? Elkanah, of course. He has two wives. We hear why he has two wives. Hana was his first. Pina is the one when the aunt has children, so that's why he married her. And as we discussed last week, don't worry, he's going up not just three times a year, but four times, two ba'av as well. And he's doing everything he can because he wants to try to encourage, try to elicit a response from Akadosh Baruch Hu to uh, grant his wife children. And together with Chana and Pnina, Sham Shni Bnei Eli, Chofni Upen Chaskonim LaHashem, a beautiful presentation of characters. We have El Kana and his two wives, Chana Pnina, and we have Eli and his two sons, Chofni Penchas. They even sound alike, Chet Nun Pei Nun. Again, so beautiful. By he Hi Yom, by Yisbach El Kana VeNatan LePnina Yishto LeChovan El VeNotah Hamanotu LeChana Yitim Mana Chatapayim Kiat Chana Ahed VaShem Saga Rachma. And again. The Navi is telling us Elkanah is doing everything that he can in order to somehow not only alleviate Hannah's pain, but also appease HaKadosh Baruch Hu. V'chiyas atat tzarat ha'gam kas. V'avor harimah ki sagar Hashem ba'ad rachmah. Three times we've heard this already. V'chein ya'aseh. But then again, Elkanah is in the spotlight. He does this shana b'shana. He goes and he offers karbanot. And he brings Hana and Pnina along. And he prostrates himself before God. And he offers the shlamim to Hana as well. Midei alotah v'vei tashem. Kim tachisana batevkeh v'lo tochal. 
and Hana watches, and Hana sees, as we discussed last week, the woman dancing, and she remembers her years of youth, and she remembers that it's been years since her marriage, and she still doesn't have a child, and she doesn't eat. And El Kana one year just says to her, you know what, Hana, let's just be content with the status quo. Hello, anochi toblach me'asarabanim. Can we just uh, be this wonderful, loving couple? And uh, can we uh, just focus on our relationship and maybe forfeit that dream? Because it's been year after year. And really, how could Hannah have responded at this point? She could have been passive. She could have said, you know what? You're right. Sometimes we just have to make do with the lot that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us in life. Sometimes we just have to be content with the status quo. Maybe we'll make the most of the situation and we'll go around to all the different campuses and inspire them. But instead, Chana, here's that word again, Batokom Chana, Acharei Ochlo Bishilo, Acharei Shato. Chana says, I'm not going to be passive. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something. And albeit as we see it from the subsequent psukim, it wasn't really so common for women to get up. Number one, for them to stand and not prostrate themselves, to stand and pray without bringing a korban, to stand in the mishkan and to say something to yourself. Very uncommon. Batakomachana. She gets up and now the spotlight is on her. And she's going to change the course of Jewish history. Similarly, as we said, who's going to be the hero of the story? Definitely Elimelech. And everyone else, they're just the secondary characters. No, me, Machlon, Chilion. Okay, Elimelech dies. Still, who's left? Machlon, Chilion. They'll inherit their fathers, both a property, legacy. They'll do something. Uh oh, yes, they do. They marry Moabite women and they die as well. And this is where we saw by Yamutu Gam Shnehem, Machlon, Bechilion, Batish Erhe, Shab, Mishne, Yelada, Omi Isha. And I don't think anyone would cast an eye if we just ended the story right here. And Naomi would spend the rest of her life in Chutz La'aret, crying by their graves. But instead, It's Naomi who then will be called the mother. It's Naomi, the childless mother, who gets up. And together with Dvorah and Hanan, changes the course of Jewish history. So notice Shoftim Perakei, it's going to be Dvora Acha Kamti Dvora Kamti in the Israel root or Naomi, the childless mother, Batihi Lo Loomenet. And ultimately, Hana, after she already forfeits her son, and he's going to serve Pene Hashem Naar Chagur Ifod Bad, Omi Il Katan Taselo Imo, Valatalo Miamim Yamima, Valuta Etisha, the Zboa Chetzabacha Yamim. She ends up the same way that the story began, with her husband sacrificing Miyamim Yamima. There's just one difference. This time she has a child, but the child actually isn't fully hers. But now she will be called the mother. What is Shmuel Hanabi teaching us? Let's go back then to the first story, chronologically the first story, the story of Dvorah during the time of the Shuftim. All we know about her is that she is Eshet Lapidot. And in fact, she has said to Barak, you should be the one to go and fight the war. But because you haven't, she already is going to note political, social, religious commentary. And she says, Ephes, stop and pause the same exact word that we find by the Meraglim. Ephes, even though the land is good, Pause and hold because now we're going to give you a different commentary. She says, stop, take two. We have to start the story over because now she says there's something wrong. You're the general. The story should have been about you. Shmuel Hanavi is putting these words in her mouth in order to basically recognize religious commentary. And she says, and all of us, because we have to pretend that we don't know the story, we should be raising our eyebrows right now and saying, this doesn't make any sense. 
The military victory is going to come through the hand of a woman. What is she basically saying? Look at our society. Firstly, the men are not standing up and fulfilling the roles that the men should be fulfilling. And secondly, if that's the case, what is Deborah saying then? Then I guess we just have to be these women. But she's recognizing this is not the ideal. FS, wait, stop, rock, this is exclusive. Men are not fulfilling their roles. As a result, women have to step in to fulfill the men's roles. But what does that mean? But now the women won't be fulfilling their female roles. And she basically says, yes, we're living in a topsy-turvy society. One where if we take a look at Sefer Shuftim, we find that everything is awry. People are, as we know, right after the time period of Dvoran, the time of Gidon, people are threshing wheat in a wine press. And people who are belong in the south are now in the north. No one's in their right territory. A man from Beit Lechem finds himself all the way in Ephraim. The people from Dan are going to move away from their God-destined territory all the way to areas that weren't even promised in Eretz Israel. Nothing and no one is where they belong. And women are not now, as she herself says, serving in their proper roles. Vatakom Dvora, Dvora herself included. And let's see as we continue the story and we hear Vatal Imo Dvora. Dvora is the one to go up with the Barak all the way to her Tabor. Chever Hakeni, and here is another irony within the story. His name is Chever. Chever, what do you expect of him? He should be a good Chaver. He's a Keni. And what does he do? Nifrad Mikayin. He left his brethren. Not a very good Chaver. Moshe. He's going to leave the people, the descendants, the Kenim, the descendants of Yitro. And instead, he's going to go up and join an alliance with the Canaanim in the northern areas. We're getting ready for a war scene. And sure enough, while all the 900 chariots of Sisra are now surrounding Har Tabor. We could all picture Har Tabor overlooking Nachal Kishon. What are we waiting for? At least now, the general, take charge, right? And say, fire. And uh, let's go and attack. But instead, who calls everyone to war? The Tomer Dvorah El Barak. It's Dvorah who says, um, I think it's time. Right, you should be doing something now. Kum, I've been the one. Vatokom, vatokom, your turn. Kizet hayom, Hashem natan Hashem et Yisrael biyadecha. Hello, Hashem yatzal lefanecha. And instead of vayakom, here the Navi clearly states vayered Barak. Barak will do something. He's going to go down the mountain, and as we see, he doesn't get credit for the victory. Instead, vayaham. Hashem et Sisra, Hashem will perform on the Huma, Bagirid Sisra me Alham Rakaba, Barak and Sisra, we're going to see our parallel characters, the two generals that we expect to be, the courageous ones, are the ones who are constantly going down. Bayanas Barak Lab, Sisra is going to run away with his feet. And similarly, as uh, he continues, nas beraglav, nas beraglav, we hear as well that barak radaf acharei harechev. The focus is on their feet, but clearly not, as Dvorah said, kibiad isha. Whose hands are we going to look at? Let's take a look. Pasuk yudchet. Batitze ya elekrat isra, batom reilav, sura admi, sura ilai altira, vayaser ilaha ohela, vatachaseu bismicha. And he tells this woman, the wife of Khiver Hakini, well, you're supposed to be, you're the Isha, you're the ally. You wait out by the entrance of the tent. And if a man should come and ask you, the whereabouts of a man, the Amar Hayesh Poish, the Amart Ayin. And does Yael have to lie? 
if she says there's no man inside? Absolutely not. Because uh, Sisra has also now been uh, in a cowardly state. And notice what the woman does. The woman of the tent. The woman who seduces Sisra. She now becomes the warrior. She takes uh, the atade of the ohel and risking her life is going to knock it into Sisra's temple until he collapses, he gets a concussion, and he dies. In the meantime, everyone notice the triple irony? Barak, let me show you the man that you seek. If the reference is to Sisra, what type of man is she going to show him? A dead man. Let me show you the dead man. In other words, the men in the story, not so active right now. And if you're looking, you're the one who thought that maybe you'll kill the general, let me show you the man that you seek. Let me show you the man, i.e. Barak, this is really what you should have done. Or the triple irony. You want to see the man that took care of what really needed to be taken care of? I'll show you the man because you're actually looking at her. In other words, the men who are passive, the women who are active. But notice even in the case of Yael, poor Yael. I can only imagine the continuation of the story. Her husband, the ally of Sisra, comes home and sees Sisra did, and knows also perhaps that his own wife seduced him. Who knows what the end of Yael is going to be? We don't find a continuation of this heroine other than the struggle ending with a song. Atashar Dvora Dvora in the first person initiates the song. Tivorach minashim Yael, Eshet Chaber Hakimi. She will be the wife, but never call the mother. And here's the irony. But she will be amongst the women of the tent. Chazal tell us with the imahot, like Sarah and Rivka and Rachel and Leah. And of herself, she says, And we're all wondering, Dvorah, we love you very much. We thank you very much. You're a wonderful prophetess. You're a wonderful judge. You're even a wonderful military general. But you're not a mother. Why is Shmuel allowing you to call yourself a mother? The Malbim explains. She basically says, I want everyone to know that I am not a mother, that really I should have been a mother. But because of the situation of the time, because of this topsy-turvy world, because no one is fulfilling their roles, I wasn't able to fulfill my role. And instead, though, I became a different type of mother. I became a military mother. I became a national mother. I became the mother of Israel because uh, had I not birthed them right now, the nation would have been destroyed. I became a different type of mother. I became the mother that birthed this nation. And as the Mitzudot explain, I became the mother who had to give rebuke when no one else was doing so. Came Anochi li Yisrael. And therefore we find that the Dats Kenin Mibale Hatosafot explain that in the end, this Dvora served a very similar role to Dvora Meineket Rivka. She was a nursemaid, albeit we never hear of her children. But as we find in Parak Lamedheim, the Meineket of Rivka, who dies, as we know, upon the return to Eretz Yisrael, and an alone, alone bachut, a tree is going to be called after her and the tears of Yaakov Avinu. What does it mean that she's the meineket, she's the omenet, she's the megadelet? She may not actually be a nursemaid in as much as the teacher. She's the one who raises Rivka, who then helps bring Yaakov back to Eretz Yisrael. She's the dvorah, literally the, the bee, the one who restores 
the yeth, the milk, the mineket, and the honey to Eretz Yisrael. Rashi and the Baal Zkinim says that's the same tree that Devor resting under between the areas of Ramat and Begdel, that alone Devor mineket v'cha. Because she is a similar type of nursemaid, not really mother, teacher, leader of Am Yisrael. Which is why Rashi says, Dvorah also mentions Ya'el, Minashim Ba'oel Tvorach Ya'el Lama. Why is she calling her the ideal mother of the tent? I hope no one else's tent has a dead general with a missing Ya'teid from the tent Ya'el Lama. Him Yaldu Bigadlu. Why is she comparing her to the Nashim of the Ohel? Ask the Midrash. After all, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, the cold women of the Oa, because they raised families. They didn't kill generals in their tents. Because without Ya'el, in fact, the people would have been killed. So it's as if she's a woman of the tent who birthed a nation. Or, but because she was found in the tent and Chazal say with her tzniyot, so she's also called the woman of the tent. But let's continue and see how this thing continues in all of the writings of Shmuel. After all, Chazal even tell us that it's very possible by Hebrew Meshvot HaShoftim that the same story of Ruth, it must be that Ruth and Naomi were inspired by women such as Yael and Zvorah. After all, Rav says, Whose time period was this? Barak and Zvorah. Rafuna says, Zvorah, Barak and Ya'el. And in fact, if we turn the page, we find numerous parallels in Adiyah, not only storylines, but linguistic similarities that support the comparison between the story of Zvorah and the story of Ruth, especially the Hapex Legamanon by Yaham. It only appears, as we know, by the story of Kriyat Yamsuf, certainly reminiscent of the story of Nachal Kishon by Har Tavor, and the story of uh, the wars of the north, but also between uh, the stories of Ruth and the stories of Shuvtim, both by Yahum Susra, by Yam Hashem, the uh, turmoil, the Muhuma, literally the chaos that ensues. The same word is used to describe the atmosphere of bewilderment when the entire city, Batehom, everyone is bewildered on the uh, rearrival of Naomi. Also, the command Sura, Sura, that we saw indicative in the words of Ya'el. In the story of Dvorah, this is how Ya'el instructs Sisra to turn aside, how she seduces him to enter her tent, where she uh, ostensibly is offering him all different types of hospitality. And the story of Ruth to Boaz directs the Go'el in a similar way come in order to perpetuate a family. The same word by Yasar. The adverb of bala'at in a secret, in a gentle manner appears in both stories as well. For the sake, what you know, in the case of Deborah, it's actually to end the life. In the case of Ruth, it's to sleep with Boaz and perpetuate life. The doubling of the verb of lech in Deborah's determination to fight the enemy, she says twice over, okay, and uh, you should have gone, but instead, Vatelech, she goes instead or together with him. Barak disregards Deborah's authority. He says to her, Im telchi imi elech, im lo telchi im lo telech imi, then lo elech. As opposed to clearly root. What does she tell Naomi? Wherever you go, Kalasher telchi elech. Barak's equivocal loyalty and the negative is contrasting with Ruth's categorical, unanticipated loyalty to Naomi, dismissing Naomi's compelling bid to dissuade Ruth from accompanying her to Beit Lechem. Ruth is the one to say, wherever you go, I will go. And uh, not only that, but without forcing me, without any pressure. We take a look at the chart at the top of page seven and see these linguistic parallels very clearly. Shmuel Hanabi is saying there are similar phenomena that are occurring in both of these stories. And it's not only women assuming the roles that men should have been active in taking, it's more than that. We're going to see a different type of mother as well. We're going to see a mother, Naomi, who albeit is really no longer a mother because she lost her children. Nonetheless, the Navi gives her the credit of being the mother because she understands what it means to provide for, because she is going to be the driving force behind, ultimately, the family that will continue despite the deaths of her children. 
Let's take a look and see this depicted beautifully in the words of Ruth when she turns to Boaz and says, Vatomer emsachain be'inacha dumeki nechamtani, v'chi di barta alev shevchatecha. She recognizes that Boaz is the one, and notice the uh, translation, that you have spoken to the heart of your maidservant. And what does she mean? Does she mean that he's just very charming, that he spoke very nicely, or that this is a way, in fact, of you did something, you comforted my heart, and particularly in what manner? We're going to see in a manner that you provide and support for me as opposed to what we find in Sefer Shoftim, where the man who takes up Pilegesh, he goes after her to her father's home where she has been, what is he going to promise her? Don't worry, what will I do? I'll take care of you. This time, you don't have to go with another man because I'll provide for you. In a Rishi Perak Nona, we see that the same exact term, is employed by Yosef after the death of Yaakov. I mean, you know, the brothers are afraid that Yosef is going to take vengeance. And instead, what does Yosef say? No, anochi achalkel etchem, etavchem b'inachim otam. They're afraid that they may, he may deprive them of food. In Am Mitzrayim, and he says, b'yidaber aliba. Speaking to someone, to someone's heart, is not just saying nice words. It's reassuring them that you'll be there, there to support them physically, emotionally. Yeshayahu therefore says, Tell Yerushalayim, that is now bereft, tell Yerushalayim that I will be there. Tell Yerushalayim that I will take care of her, that I will provide for her. And the Yalko Shimoni says exactly that. Amara Kadosh Baruch Hu, Eva Boaz, Boaz Menachem, Yishalim Hashem Palech, Boaz can take care of Ruth, Shibibar Liba, Shorut, Varim Tovim, Devin Nefumim, Nihamua, Batomar Msachim Bene Adoni, Shabbat Kadosh Barachol, Menachem et Israel, Alachat Kama Vakama. Hashem says, Look at what it means to go and to provide. If all of you are taking care of the widows, Boaz, if you're going to provide for Ruth, you don't know, really have to at all. You're going to ensure the perpetuation of the family. Hashem says, I have no excuse. I have to come and wait till you see how I will provide for you. We continue in Sefer Ruth, recognizing that that's exactly what Boaz does. And uh, the child that's born, we look and see, Hashem the Navi could have so easily said that Ruth not only conceived, but tailored Ben, and now she's an ima mazel tov, but no, but tomorrow night Hashem el Naomi, Baruch Hashem Meshalu Ishbit Lach Goel Ayom Vayikari Shimo Beisro Vayalach Meishem Nefesh Ulechal Kelate Vatech He's going to provide for you. Ki Kalatech Hashem Vatech Yeladuto Asheri Tovalach Mishiba Banim. Yes, so Ruth is like seven sons, and you're the Omenet. Nonetheless, the Midrasha in a Rutsuta tells us not to worry. Ruth lived uh, many, many, many years, and albeit in Sefer Ruth, she's not once called the mother, but she is going to live to see her great, great grandson Shlomo as king, and therefore Ruth Moabia will one day be called Ima Shel Malchut. Notice that we don't have an Av of Malchut. Poor Boaz, right? He doesn't get the credit. Neither really does Ruth within the story. It's Nomi who's called the Ima. And eventually, Ruth will be called the Ima of Malchut. So now it's a little strange. We're in that same terminology of Medaber Aliba. Now we take a look and see Ruth and Chana parallels. And we see that it's not just about Vora and Ruth, it's Ruth and Chana. Chana hi Medaberet Aliba. What does that mean? Chana is trying to do what? To speak words of comfort to herself. Hana is trying to nourish herself. She realizes my husband sacrifices, that's not enough. As Mark beautifully said, we can nourish ourselves. As Dodi taught us beautifully, so just Davin. That's really how she said it. <laughs> just Davin. You're in a bad mood, things aren't going well. Davin. Turn to Hashem. Just turn to Hashem. And no matter how sick, 
physically, emotionally, no matter how weary and tired, no matter how bereft you are of hope. Atidaber aliba. Speak to your heart. Because we can nourish ourselves. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in fact, will, will provide. Hashem will give us that strength to continue. And it's still Chana, who is not happy looking at her husband, who says, She's so badly wants to be a mother. She turns to God, Chazal say, Rabbi Eliezer says, as one belligerent with God. But to daber al liba, Hashem, I need to turn to you. I need you, Batiskareni. You have to look at me. I need to know that I'm still on your radar. She turns to God belligerently. She teaches us what prayer is all about. You can argue with God. God, really, is it really so hard for you to make me a mother? You can't give me just one child. You know, a lot of people have a lot of kids. I'm just asking for one. Look, Hashem, you're the king. You have so much food. I'm the poor person knocking on the door asking for a little morsel of bread. Really? And why shut the door on me? You know what, God? I'll tell you what. And if uh, I really just want you to see the suffering that I'm enduring right now, but it's okay, Imra O. And if you see me and you finally pay attention to me again, that's great. If not, tear it. Then you just watch and wait. You, know, you want to know what I'm willing to do? I'm willing to have yichud with a man, have my husband suspect me of being an Isha Sota. And not, not doing uh, anything with this man, but just uh, for the sake of uh, going through the humiliating experience of the Sota woman. And then uh, this way, once I drink those terrible bitter waters, then uh, just as the Torah promises, you say that if I'm truly absolved and I'll have a child, if this is what you want me to do, then that's what I'll do. But to Daber Aliba, she teaches us just like Ruth, just like Naomi, what it means to be provided, but ultimately as we turn to God. And therefore, one could argue that she's the closest one to a mother. It's not really a mother. Her child isn't there, but she is the mother. She does restore society to the way that it should be. That Barbanel says, what does it mean that she makes him a little me'il? So much so that Shaul and the Ba'alat Ob still see Shmuel and a me'il, even posthumously. Wait a second, maybe she's making him one of his garments as a lady, as a Kohen. But no, she would go every year, even though really he should be provided for in the Mishkan. But she would go, she would remeasure him to see whether or not the coat from last year still fits him, to see whether or not the Rebbe that he had last year in the Chinuch of the Mishkan is still appropriate for him, or should, if she should switch grades or teachers. She would try to see, even if she wasn't necessarily the constantly hands on mother. Shmuel Hanabi says, but she was the greatest mother because the Me'il was still there. And therefore, she's able to say, Ada Karayelda Shiva. Just like Devora, who sings a song after her struggle, albeit childless, just like Chana recognizes the barren woman really is childless, but that can change. They both sing songs. And one could and should argue, so wait a second, how about Ruth? Where's her song as the childless mother? What's the answer? She has 150 of them of Sefer Tehillim. Beautifully said in the parallel to be loved, Tehillim Yudchet, Hai Hashem Baruch Tzuri, Bayarum Eloke Yishi, Hakel Hanotei Nekamotli, Beidaber Amin Tachtai, Mifalti Me'oyvani. She knows how to sing her songs. And it's uh, her great grandson who will sing her songs for her as well. So notice that Ruth, just like Hana, they're both going to be mothers as well, albeit the unconventional type. 
They both have to deal with societal alienation, Hana from Penina, Ruta from the woman of Beit Lechem, and the Na'ar Hanitza Val HaKutzrim. They both experience terrible loneliness and anguish, but they have uh, the strength and resolve to become mothers, to uh, not be content with the status quo and not rely on the men in the story, but to be the proactive ones to ultimately help, uh, whether it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu or Nomi, have a child. These are childless mothers in the sense that they undergo extraordinary sacrifice. Each woman relinquishes her son voluntarily for a higher cause and keeping where they're with the recognition that these sons do not rightly belong to them, but are rather born with a specific divine destiny. It demonstrates that their fierce determination was never selfish, but rather motivated by a broader goal. Hannah therefore bequeaths her son Shmuel to the Mishkan, where he grows as an apprentice to Eli, and Ruth confers her son Obed upon Naomi, who raises him as her own and ensures his rightful place in the genealogy of the Davidic dynasty. So who are these mothers? They are the mothers who teach us, ironically, what motherhood is really all about. It's the restoration of leadership and compassion. And in case we're not sure, we hear that Vora, one could argue the least of the mothers and the greatest of the mothers, the national mother of Am Yisrael, contrasts her motherhood with that of Aim Sisra. And Chazal teach us, don't forget about her, even on Rosh Hashanah. Think of the childless mothers and think of Aim Sisra, who one can argue is childless by virtue of the fact that she loses her son Sisra in war. And yet, Zvora, who begins the song with, Atcha Kamti Zvora, Kamti Aim Be Yisrael, she says, look at me. And now look at Aim Sisra who's crying beyond ishnab waiting for her son to come home. Why is his chariot delayed? Why don't I hear the wheels of his chariot coming? So don't worry. She says, you want to hear what consoles her? The various advisors tell her, don't worry. They say, don't worry, don't worry. And she says, oh, don't worry. I'm not worried because I know what's delaying my son. Everyone holding on tight. This is what's delaying him. It must be that they're delayed giving up the spoils of war. It's taking my son a long time. They're distributing the wombs of women to men, either literally the wombs that they've dismembered from the women's bodies, or that uh, he's busy raping so many women. So uh, it's taking him a long time. He's waiting for literally the glory and the spoils of war, just like Racham Rachmatayim said that Rachmatayim. He's waiting for them to put medals, medals of honor on him. Here we find the irony. Zvara is saying, maybe I never had a child. But I'll tell you that motherhood is about restoring compassion and proper leadership in Ani Israel. And look at Aim Sisra, who ironically is really not much of a mother. Zvara therefore becomes a mother through her military role in restoring, literally, control over Eretz Yisrael, the mother of the land, bringing back together with Yael, who brings the milk, she brings the honey, the dvash and chalab of Eretz Yisrael. Ruth restores societal, political leadership and compassion as she builds the bayit, as she builds the second pillar on Yisrael. And Chana, indeed, is the mother of Torah Yisrael, not only of Nebuat Shmuel, but of restoring proper religious structure and the basis of Tzvila that we have today. And it's not only Am Yisrael, Eret Yisrael, Torah Yisrael that's bounded by these mothers, but as we find Shimon HaTzadik tells us, the three pillars of the world are in fact Torah, Avodah, Kmeilut Chasadim. They may not have been called mothers, but they are the greatest of our mothers. 
the ones who can found Torah like Chana, the Avuda of Dvora, and certainly the Gmeilut Chasadim of Ruth and Naomi. The Midrash Sutta tells us, in every generation, as we know, it's the women. The Wa are the ones responsible for catalyzing Geula. And that's why Eshet Chayil is written, Me Aleph Ataf, to teach us, Ein Hadorot Negalin, Ela Beschut Nashim Tidkaniot Shebedor. Every time I would have him for Miriam Dodi, but Chana Yochadeh, I would think of how she represents the strength and the song of Miriam. The love, really, of the Dod, the Doda of Shira Shirin, the strength of motherhood of Chana and Yochadeh. Shreemar Zachar Chasto Ve'emunato Lebeit Yisrael. Lebeit Yisrael, Lebnei Yisrael, Lovna Amar. Amuna and the strengthening of Amuna comes particularly from the Bayit, from the Bat and the Banot of Israel. I'd like to end with a point that Melissa had mentioned during the summer. She said, Shani, I know you're going to speak about childless mothers. And especially as Yishayahu turns and he says, Look, just like root and short, but to Daber Aliba. Just like Chana turns to Hashem, there's one more mother. There's one more childless mother. And that's uh, as Yishayahu said, and as we read just two weeks ago, Rami Akara Lo Yalada. Yerushalayim is also childless. She really is barren, but she had children. They're just now bereft. Don't worry, says Yishayahu, because one day, it's true that now you have more children of desolation, but don't worry, because the day is coming. We're going to have to uh, reconstruct your house, add on uh, some extra rooms. Don't spare any money. Spread your curtains, spread your rooms, because you're going to need as many rooms as possible. For all those children and grandchildren, chaziki, strengthen your home, because they're going to return. And you, Yerushalayim, you'll be happy once again. You will sing your song, Petri Verumi. You will rejoice once again. That childless mother will in fact be consoled by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As uh, you were bereft, you uh, no longer have the dough, perhaps, but don't worry. I left you too quickly. One day. I will bring you back. I will bring back all the children, all the wives, all the mothers. I will restore the children to Yerushalayim. And even though it looks like there's a lot of anger and hysteria panim, olam amar just keep turning to me, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I assure you, I assure you, Yerushalayim, that you will be that happy mother once again, that you will be restored, and all those below the us will be restored as well. And in the meantime, we turn to our mothers, and we remember the legacy of not just the childless mothers in Tanakh, but the ones who are, in fact, the greatest of the mothers teaching us messages of Emuna and Tvila and what it means to Daber al Halev. Without the Ezrat Hashem, we'll be able to rejoice once more.